Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Rebecca Cohen and the 1991 East Coast Music Awards. I am Matt Minglewood, I think, but we're not sure. Thank you, Matt. I'm Catherine McKinnon, and I'm your co-host for tonight's awards. We're gathered here tonight to salute those who make the music of Atlantic Canada. We come to preserve our past, honor our present, and to look to the future. The people who put this show together say this is a miracle. Five years ago, no one would have bought a ticket to watch maritime performers give each other an award. And yet tonight, the East Coast Music Awards are packed. This is the evidence of a real change. The maritime music industry is no longer stuck singing in a bar on a Saturday afternoon. It's videos and cross Canada concert tours and brand new recording studios being built right here. It's no longer having to move to Toronto or Los Angeles in order to make it in the industry. Tonight we'll introduce you to the people in front of the audiences and behind the scenes. The people who are struggling to make it and those who already have. As we show you that note by note, the East Coast music industry is waltzing towards success. Music has always echoed through the hills and valleys of Atlantic Canada. The rich cultural tradition is garnered from a varied ethnic background. From Gaelic folk songs to the gospel hymns of freed slaves. From Acadian jigs to Irish ballads. There's never been a shortage of talent, but for years, the doors have been closed to many when it comes to the larger picture of musical success. There's a parallel between that situation and this grotty old theatre in the north end of Halifax. The Casino Theatre also has a long and colourful career, providing fond memories for many. But it gradually deteriorated, and its doors were finally closed two years ago. Today it has a new reason for being. It is now the centre of a rejuvenation of music originating from the grassroots community level. Its walls now vibrate with new life, with the sounds of young bands and alternative performers who simply wouldn't be booked anywhere else. The casino is not here to make a profit. It's here to provide a stage and an audience for the rich musical tradition that remains. here to encourage people to use this facility. If they think they have a show to put on and an audience for that show, then we try to encourage them to, uh, to be able to do that. And uh, actually my uh, current catchphrase is art with heart. I feel that the people who come here believe in what they're doing. We don't put on shows that are just to make money. We put on shows that people care about. Especially the younger bands need, any, any young artist I think needs an audience, needs a place to be able to do their thing. I mean, art thrives in the public eye, as far as I'm concerned, and develops in a, a relationship with its audience. It shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be just done in a vacuum. The casino is one of two so-called alternative venues in Halifax. The Flamingo Cafe and Lounge is better known. Bands from all over the world book here. It's a club small enough to provide some intimacy, but large enough to be a worthwhile gig. When the Flamingo opened six years ago, it broke some rules, big rules. It booked non-unionized bands, bands who didn't have enough money to join the musicians' union, and as a result, couldn't legally be booked in clubs. The new venue gave them a chance to play, and audiences a chance to experience the new music coming out of the region. Well, no one sought to address the fact that uh a lot of people were unhappy with what was available in, in, in musical entertainment and uh, for some reason we just decided to do it um, uh, and I think it's turned out okay. Our Monday and Tuesday nights with the, uh, the, open, the open mic format on Monday night with uh, numerous amateur talent and Tuesday night is now one band.
from that, that, that open mic playing. And the, both those nights are, are becoming extremely successful, and we have some support from the breweries for it. So um, I think, I think we've, we've simply expanded on, on what it means to be alternative in a city where there's no one else doing reggae, there's no one else doing real blues, there's no one else doing Zydeco. Alternative means addressing, addressing all, the, all the different types of music that were other than top 40. And, com and commercial hit music and, and cover bands that weren't available before. And I think that's, you know, that's where we are and that's where we're always going to be. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. That is still the Flamingo's prime role. Unrecorded groups, those still formulating their sound, can play here before an audience. Country girl, come to the city, looking for a strange affair. The mother said, isn't it a pity? I wonder what'll happen there. Two Dollar Tuesdays provide an outlet for just about anybody to show their stuff. It's open mic night, and one Tuesday, just before the East Coast Music Conference and Awards took place, the bands nominated for the Unrecorded Artist of the Year commandeered the stage. It was their own showcase. You never went to the taverns, which is wild, it all down, we drank on a whole other part of town. But most of these musicians aren't out to steal the spotlight. They work during the day to survive. They play for the love of the music. Playing is just like this. There's no other feeling like it. Eh? There's no other feeling like it. Well, especially in a band like this, you know, those when those horns are going, you just don't get that feeling anywhere else. And that's it's a privilege to do it, to be able to do it for people. Eh? It's uh, I can't give it up. Theo Helsinger is lead singer with the Floorboards. During the day, he's a carpenter. The band's drummer, Jerry Johnson, is a Dalhousie professor and researcher. Bass player John Chasson is a photographer. And guitarist Sandy McDonald is the entertainment writer for the Halifax Daily News. Other members teach music. All have full-time jobs. They work all day, and once or twice a week, they gather in sax player Chris Kroll's basement to practice. On stage, they're an eight-piece R&B band with a dedicated following and a nomination for Unrecorded Artist of the Year. There's kind of a joke among the, the band members that we're out. Well, whenever we get in yeah, whenever we get in battles of the bands or any of these sort of things, we always lose. And so we're we really are just a bunch of losers. And our first, I think our first thought was, oh well, here we go. We're going to lose again. <laughs> and the winner is the floorboards. All right.
For performers, music is the culmination of passion and performance and the rush that it gives them. But in reality, the industry is a spiderweb of incomprehensible technology, unapproachable and a little scary. The music industry is not run by poets, but by computers, technicians and businessmen. I produced a group called the Doobie Brothers a couple of years ago. And I had a Macintosh set up in the control room when they, they first walked in on the first day of recording. And they, I swear to God, they like crossed themselves and ran out and bought garlic and stuff. <laughs> For how crosses up and stuff. I mean, it was the devil incarnate because the, these guys were used to recording in the early 70s and, and uh, thought of a computer. They thought it was HAL 2000 you know, <laughs> until like, until like uh, 2001, Space Odyssey. World renowned producer and songwriter Eddie Schwartz joined in the East Coast Music Conference in an effort to help local musicians understand the technology they're up against. It is, a, it is an industry, it, the music business is a business. It's not the same. Music business and music are not necessarily the same thing. And if you're going to get into the music business, I think you do have to understand what you're getting into. And uh, uh, I, most, of the, most of the successful people that I know have developed a persona. In other words, they've develop, developed a, a public image that they can step back from when it gets too heavy, when it gets too intense. And I think that's a very healthy thing to do. For an entire day, he took them through the recording procedure to teach them the intricacies of producing. The theory is, the more people that understand that, the less people that have to leave. There are three key elements to succeeding, and talent isn't always at the top of the list. You have to first get your song on tape, then get it out there so people can buy it, and finally, you have to be seen. All that technology has suddenly become more accessible to East Coast musicians. Small independent studios are now set up to process just about anything and anyone. You could come in and sing your song a cappella to me and I could have it on a tape uh, with the production good enough to give to uh, a radio station tomorrow. The Rankin family is one of the best-known bands in the region, but getting their tapes on the record store shelves has been a struggle. The band decided to take the task on themselves. They drove from store to store, selling the tapes out of the trunk of their car. In the beginning, we had no choice. I mean, who knew the Rankin family outside Cape Breton? So um, we knew that we, had, we, if we did put out a tape, we'd have to do it ourselves, distribute it. And we saw that we did a good job of it, so we continue, we, we maintain that, you know, right now we're probably the best option for our tape, distributing our tape. But most artists take a more direct route to distribution, sending off demos to industry representatives centered in Toronto. They can approach us a number of different ways. They can send us tapes. You know, we had a panel discussion as a part of this um, event that was going on. I mean, you can come in through a manager, a lawyer, or an agent. You can send in a tape. You can, I mean, there's countless ways. We're not, you know, in quotes, uh, untouchable. You know, we're, we're there. There really are no tricks. You know, you got to be patient. I guess that's one of them. But uh, there are no tricks to, uh, to get in. Technology is indeed taking over the industry. Once you could take your homemade tape to a radio station and hope they'd play it. But now, most radio stations only play CDs, and CDs are expensive to make. One Toronto company has an innovative option that gives independent musicians a chance to lease a spot on a compilation CD. The company then distributes that compilation to radio stations. One of the key things that I want to do here at the East Coast Music Awards is to tell them to get their tapes off the shelves, that if they've been unsuccessful in shopping them to majors, that they can independently put them out to radio stations across the country. And one of the ways we do it now is with a compact disc uh, compilation. And so, I mean, you, something tragic happens if you don't try. Nothing. And so my one of my main purposes is to tell them to get up, get the music out of the bars and out of the bedrooms and onto the radio stations and get them out. But even Joe will admit being heard isn't enough anymore. 
today you have to be seen. Videos, the latest element in the ever-expanding music industry. You can't just sing well and write good songs anymore. For every song you release, you pretty well have to produce one of these. That's a bone of contention for a lot of artists who say their songs should be able to stand on their own. But that's just not reality in the music industry of the 1990s. Part of the big machine, you know, it's part of getting your music out. It's part of, especially when you live in a country like Canada, it's so huge and, and sparsely populated and spread out. You have to have a way of getting your music out. Um, the, uh, this was the neat stuff, actually, the, uh... Can speed this up? Uh, you can tell how just nervous I was at this I don't like the idea of people associating my music with my face. Because I didn't sit in front of a mirror to write it. You know, uh, the mirror is much deeper than my face. And I was intrigued, I was petrified. The first few shoots were awful. Just awful. I felt like Pinocchio. You know, I, re I really felt like I had no ability to do anything for myself. I'd, my body just shut down. I was petrified by the camera and uh, by strangers watching me sing, lip sync my song. I felt so awkward. It was like, this, this sucks. I'm, this is awful. I'm not doing this. This is all a big mistake. <laughs> The people behind the East Coast Music Awards know this technological web needs unraveling. That's why in the three days prior to the awards ceremony, various workshops were held to help explain the mystery. You should consult with a, with a post producer or, an, or a consultant or an editor or the owner of the, of the facility and make sure that you're covering all of your costs because they can build up quickly. To think that a couple plays on much music is going to deliver your music to an audience uh, far in excess of any number of clubs you could travel, you know, if you put your band in a van and traveled across the country a couple of times, playing every, you know, every town and every bar. Just the exposure on much music is, is really astronomical. I hear bands tell me, you know, the satellites come to Halifax and play the Misty Moon, and they're from Toronto, they don't travel that much, they don't understand why the audience is grooving to their music and understands the lyrics and knows their music. Well, it's from the exposure they've had on much, on much Music. Conversely, I'm in Toronto. I go to the Diamond on a Monday night to see Rollins Cross. They've never played in Toronto. They're playing and everyone's enjoying it, but as soon as Colleen comes on, which is a song that they made a music video with, um, everybody knows it. The, the recognition factors, the impact is incredible. Damn. Videos are expensive and difficult to produce if you're living in Rustico PEI with no support network. Julie Thorburn works with Video Fact. It has a million dollars available to new performers to help them produce videos from anywhere in the country. James McQuaid and Richard Gray grew up in Halifax, but they've received national attention as rappers MCJ and Cool G. The reason? Their video and much music. That's right, we all talk. We make your fingers pop. As long as we're there, the monkey... We're in an audiovisual age, so it's like... Videos, I watch videos, you probably watch much music when you're changing the channels. My mom watches it, so... Sometimes a video can turn you on to a song. You might hear a song and don't like it. See the video, yeah, I kind of like that song. You may go up the vibe because of the video, so... Yeah. Then it can make the song worse, too, so you gotta... <laughs> video's gotta be good. It's gotta be good. But you pretty well feel you have to do it, eh, for any reason? Yeah, you have to. If you want to contend and compete, you gotta have a video. I mean, if you don't have a video, it's like people don't even know who you are unless you have a video. 
MCJ and Cool G were nominated for their efforts in the video category, along with Holly Cole, Haywire from PEI, New Brunswick's Rock Voisin, and Newfoundland's Figgy Duff. Weather out the storm, Figgy Dog. All right. I think that it's, if you have a good song, it's nice to put visual images with it. But I always like it if people hear the song first and see the video after, because it's nice if people can form their own visual images of a song without having it done for them. You know. There are lots of success stories, but there is another side to the music scene. The perception is work hard, follow the formula, and with a little luck you may just get that recognition you think you deserve. But it doesn't always work that way. Black musicians say there are invisible walls blocking them, and entertainment journalists agree racism is an issue in the East Coast music scene. Um, I mean, I was sitting around the room earlier thinking, you know, Brooks and Michael and Alan and Sandy and I could go out next week, put a band together and practice at home for three or four weeks. We might not be very good, but uh, we could go out and practice and, and within a while we could probably be getting you know, gigs in the smaller bars around town, doing stuff like that. But if we were black, or even if we had one black member, it would be a lot more difficult. The doors are pretty much closed for black musicians in Nova Scotia, and it, it really is sad because this is also part of Nova Scotian heritage. And it's a part of, of, of our culture that we're being forced to celebrate in the closet. Black and artists say they've struggled against the problem of discrimination for years. At the East Coast Music Conference, black. they ask for Some help, looking for reasons why. The black music isn't played much in the clubs. And I mean, if you were there to watch when they do play it, the dance floor is packed. But, you know, so I mean, I think everybody likes it. It's not just the black music. I mean, blacks, whites, oriental, everybody likes the type of music. But I don't know. They just don't respect it enough. We make our own shows. And if we've done, in the, the last six months, or in the last year that we've been together, we, the only shows that we've had is when uh, some concerts, some big name uh, acts have come to town and we've been able to open up for them. And um, a couple of times we've performed at, uh, well, we performed at, um, the Metro Center for the United Way. You know, we, we you know, we pretty well just take what, what we what we can get. And there's nowhere to play, really. Like no clubs or anything. Over here. Let's get to grooving, baby. I wanna see you on the floor. Let's get over here, girl, get to the party. Party till you can no more. I'm down It's not like audiences aren't interested in hearing black music. This concert was one of three showcase evenings held during the East Coast Music Conference. They were meant to highlight performers many people never get a chance to see. And LC Posse was one of the few bands that got any sort of response from the crowd. A lot of black artists find that if they want to make music their career, they have to leave the Atlantic region. 
That's what MCJ and Cool G did. They grew up in Halifax, but moved to Montreal five years ago. That's when they decided to pursue music seriously. But the duo don't think everyone should have to follow in their footsteps. And that's why they're talking about coming back someday. We want to come back here and kind of be a, a vehicle for the local talent here because it's not much happening for people to really get their talent shown down here. We want to come back and maybe do our own production in Halifax in the future. Maybe you open up a studio and probably get someone to work it from, uh, from Halifax. Why do you think that's necessary? Just because people here aren't paying attention to the guys here? Just because there's no one really helping the talent down there. There's a lot of talent, but they have no way to show it. There's no outlet at all. question for all Maritimers always seems to be, can I survive in my homeland or do I have to move to the big cities of central Canada in order to succeed? Brett Ryan has found his own answer. He's one East Coast musician who's decided to tough it out here. He grew up in Halifax and has seen many of his friends go down the road. He's not following. The pace is, is, is easier on the nerves around here. You know, we've got a cottage down in Bridgewater and it's just... I, I just can't, I find myself claustrophobic in a city like that. You know, like I say, I've been there a number of times and I've been to New York and England just, and like a lot of other people and I just, uh, I'd be more comfortable living in a place like this. His decision seems to be paying off. Last year, he won the Unrecorded Artist of the Year Award. This year, he recorded an album and walked away with the Male Vocalist of the Year trophy. It was a is part of a new tradition, but it used to be, if you want to make it in the music industry, you've got to be where the industry is centered, and that means Toronto or Los Angeles. Holly Cole grew up in Halifax and lived in Fredericton for many years, but when she decided to study jazz vocals, she went to Humber College, quickly making connections within the industry in Toronto. So that's where she stays. about moving to the Maritimes all the time because I miss, more than anything, I miss the ocean. And when I went to Vancouver, it just wasn't the same. The Pacific Ocean wasn't the same for me. So, uh, so I fantasize about coming and living here, but I don't, I don't think that I will, like in the very near future, come and like permanently reside here. For some, the fantasy of others is their own reality. Newfoundland's Figgy Duff admit it's tough to live on the rock and still be successful as a Canadian artist. Desperate hard, absolutely. I mean, even harder than it is from here because you know you're just way out there, and even just even to get to Halifax is a very expensive proposition, you know. And it's you know it just costs us a mint every time we move. And then, but also there's not the population in Newfoundland to support like a full-time working band there, so it's really frustrating. But uh, at the same time, you know, it's in my opinion the best place in the world to live, so we're not going to move. Figgy Duff isn't alone in their determination to stay. Dozens of East Coast artists want to stay. They know it's not easy, so they've had to find some innovative ways to survive. We'll explore that in a minute.
Paul Eisen calls himself an old dinosaur of the music business. He's been around for years and has played in a variety of popular bands, Spice and Fast Forward. Now he writes TV jingles. and works with the Sail On Show at occasions like the Nova Scotia Tory Leadership Convention and the tribute to former Premier John Buchanan. Hold on the Myra on warm summer nights. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Bonfire blaze to the children's delight. Yeah, mostly just surviving. I mean, somebody calls you for a gig, you have to pay the mortgage this month, so what do you do? Oh, I'm not going to sing that song because I don't like that guy. You just go sing it. Meanwhile, at the end of the month, you got a big smile on your face in the bank. Oh, here, boys, here's the toast. You know, so you have to. You have to do any gig that comes along, really, you should do. This is his preferred venue, playing his own songs to an audience that's come for the music. But this doesn't pay the bills. Paul Eisen has a day job. Oh, I just got a new job with the city. I built a house, so I had to get a job with the housing authority. Had to do it. So I go to there eight to five, you know, every day, right in the nights, playing on the weekends. Hopefully it won't be forever. Smith is originally from Toronto, but says she's been smitten by the coastal charm. To survive here, she's been a cook at a tree planting camp. She's worked in a bookstore and in a bank. Now a Canada Council grant is enabling her to squeeze out a meager existence while she throws herself full time into what industry there is here. I don't know if there is one, you know. There, there's one that some, a few people are, are very anxious to cultivate. Um, but I'm still getting asked to do an awful lot for free in support of this industry. And if the concept of an industry is to support the people in it, when, when's that gonna start, you know? When will people's time and energy and talent stop being taken for granted. And producers from other parts of the country reflect Laura Smith's perceptions. We know who Ann Murray is, we know who Rita McNeil is. I mean, if you stopped the average guy in the street and said, name me two Canadian stars from the East Coast, I bet you most of them, not all of them, would say those two performers. I don't think we know the wealth that's here. But it's all relative. If you're struggling to survive and have your music heard, it's natural to assume there's no support or industry out there. But if you're a Rita McNeil, winning three awards at the East Coast Ceremony and selling records internationally, things look a little rosier. I think you can live here, work here, and travel out of here, and there's no reason that you should have to go away. We have to get behind their performers here, support them, and make it easy for them to go other places. much debate over the industry, the question of whether it even exists, one has to wonder why these artists bother to stay here, or, like Rita McNeil, move back from Toronto. Well, because it wasn't home. Okay, we're not going to move to Toronto, eh? Because we don't like it up there, eh? They don't got no good restaurants. And they're right sucky up there, eh? No, okay, I'm just kidding around. Um, what better way to uh, 
to be yourself and do what you do your best than to be with the surroundings that initiate that. Could you write your songs in the, in the concrete jungle of Toronto, I guess, is the... the exactly. Yeah. It's just not the right atmosphere. No place like home. It's a friendlier place to be uh, in terms of the rat race. And I, I don't really know this from my own experience. I know it from it being told to me by musicians who have gone to Toronto, gone to Vancouver and said, look, you know, there's a lot happening, but don't feel that great. So, you know, sitting here, I feel comfortable. I don't ever feel that I'll ever have to go to L.A. to make a record. <laughs> Well, we have come down to the final award, and as I, as, I, as I said earlier, probably the most coveted award of the evening, Entertainer of the Year. And to make the presentation, we have a founding member of April Wine, Miles Goodwin, and Halifax singer-songwriter and band leader, Wayne Nicholson. My buddy, Wayne. Okay. Nice to see you. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Hi. It's nice to be here. I just Sorry like, I was late. That's all right. I thought you were right behind me. I was. I don't I know. I just what... like to. Uh, I like. To... Uh, anyway. Anyway, I just like to, uh, before we uh, award the entertainer of the year, congratulate everyone for doing such a great job here on the East Coast Absolutely. Music Awards. This year's nominees for the prestigious Entertainer of the Year Award were Holly Cole. Our eager lips combine, then let the fire start. Stomp and Tom Connors. Load him down for the big long ride. He jumps in the cab and he's off with the brides of bagels. He's got to catch the boat to make Parmentine. Then he hits up that old New Brunswick line. To Montreal he comes just a flying with another big load of potatoes. It's Spud the Spud from the bright red mud. Rolling down the highway smiling. The Spuds are big on the back of us rig. The Palm Prince Picky Duff. Sometimes it feels like freedom. Sometimes it feels like pain From the sea of love and heartbreak The tide rolls in again I'm running out to meet it you just run away Haywire Rita McNeil. And home I do be. Home I do be. Banish thoughts of leaven. Home I do be. And the winner is. is Stompin' Tom Connors. Yeah, the girls are out to bingo and the boys are getting stink all we think no more of bingo on a Saturday, Saturday night. The glasses, they will tinkle and our eyes begin to twinkle and we think no more of bingo 
on a Saturday, Saturday night. Stomp and Tom was the only winner given an award by the record-buying public. The Entertainer of the Year is voted in by ballot. All other awards were handed out by members of the East Coast Music Association. That's a group of musicians, producers, broadcasters, anyone employed in the business. The association started these awards three years ago, and they've come a long way. Thank you. Welcome to the Rebecca Cohen. And the first category is for Male Vocalist of the Year. The first year they were held at the Flamingo. Our, uh, our first nominee. The next year in a bar. And this year, the extravaganza was carried live on television from the Maritime's premier arts centre, the Rebecca Cohen. In my father's house, in my father's house. Thank you. And they are making a real difference to musicians throughout the whole year. The showcases held in the days prior to the awards are now known well enough across the country that representatives from record companies come to scout out local talent. I think this is an untapped market and you know I agree with Stomp and Tom, it's about time. You know, there is a lot of talent, and music has no borders. You know, uh, because you're from the Maritimes doesn't, you know, eliminate you from the rest of the country or from the rest of the world, for that matter. After Brett Ryan's showcase, executives from three separate labels expressed interest in his work. There was similar response to Elsie Posse's performance. And that interest has sparked a change in the attitude of performers. I think the region really needed something like that to get people uh, you know, motivated to, as I say, you know, do something different other than top 40 music in, in the region. And, uh, it seems to have made a big difference even in the last couple of years it's around. I think it has had an effect on the musical community. And the attitude towards the awards themselves is changing too. Three years ago, no one cared if they won an East Coast Music Award. Now, artists are seeing it as something to be proud of. Thanks very much. On behalf of my friends, I'd just like to say we're very happy to be involved in the East Coast Music Awards. Thank you. At first, I, was, I felt so blasé about this. I got interviewed in my hometown newspaper, and I, I read the interview, and I, I sounded like so utilitarian about it. Like it was just basically, if it gets me more work, good. But now I'm starting to realize I do feel that um, getting nominated by your peers, uh, winning has not even entered my mind. Though I do, do think I said to David, what if, you know, what if I won? <laughs> and tried to imagine that. And tried to imagine that it probably would feel the same as if paying off your student loan. You know, it'd be that kind of a feeling. It'd be very exciting. <laughs> It wasn't Laura Smith's turn to win Female Vocalist of the Year, but that doesn't matter. This event wasn't about winning. It was about a camaraderie during the showcases and the awards ceremony itself. A feeling of excitement when people looked around and saw they weren't struggling alone. A feeling this region has more than enough talent to sustain it until the structure of the industry is built and the doors are opened wide for the voices of our songs to reach out to the rest of the world while performers stay where they're happiest in their East Coast homes. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.
us to award ourselves as being um, um, recipients to um, doing something well and being proud of what we do here in the Maritimes. Um, I think that it, may, it makes people sit up and say, hey, you know, there is something happening here and uh, I think it's time we started supporting it.